Hello, welcome. My name is Maxine Henry. I am the project director for the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center. This webinar was originally delivered in Portuguese by Fabrizia Prado and moderated by Ms. Priscilla Giamassi. The translation from Portuguese to English was completed by Ms. Fabrizia Prado, and I will record the content in English with my colleague Priscilla Giamassi. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to our, our webinar, talking about grief and COVID-19, life experiences and therapeutic strategies from acceptance and commitment therapy. My name is Priscilla Giamassi. I am the program specialist for the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center. I will be the host for today's webinar, and I felt very honored with the opportunity to serve my community in my native language when we presented this event live. Before I introduce you to today's guest presenter, here are some brief instructions about today's webinar. This webinar will be recorded and archived for future playback. It will also be translated and be recorded in Spanish and English. A copy of today's presentation will be made available after the webinar. The lines will be muted throughout the presentation so as to minimize background noise. When we get to the Q&A portion, you will have the opportunity to ask questions by clicking on the Q&A box, and I will share your questions with our presenter. We will also ask you to complete a short survey at the end of this webinar. The satisfaction evaluation is important to the work that we do and give us the opportunity to improve our training efforts. Although we do not have continued education credits for this event, we plan to do so for future events. Instructions for obtaining a certificate of completion will be sent via email by tomorrow. Well, let's start. Let's start by introducing our parent organization, the National Latino Behavioral Health Association. NALBA is a nonprofit organization based in New Mexico. NALBA was created to address the need for a unified national voice for Latino populations in the field of mental health, and also to bring attention to the great disparities that exist in the areas of access, utilization, practice-based research, and trained professional. The, the executive director of NALBA is Mr. Fred Sandoval. The mission and goal of NALBA is to influence national mental health policy, eliminate disparities in funding and access to service, and also to improve the quality of services and treatment outcomes for Latino populations. Here are NALBA's priorities. Target capacity expansion of mental health services for Latinos, Latino behavioral health evidence-based practices, legislation to increase the number of counselors, therapists, and other behavioral health practitioners, funding for co-occurring disorders of alcohol and substance abuse, opioid crisis in the Latino community, and suicide prevention. Now, allow me to introduce you to our prevention technology transfer centers. Our PTTC is part of the TTC network, a multidisciplinary resource for professionals in the prevention field. The PTTC network was established in 2018 by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA. The PTTC network is comprised of 10 domestic regional centers, two national focus area centers, and a network coordinating office. Together, the network serves the 50 US states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, the Pacific Islands of Guam, America Samoa, Palau, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and the Mariana Islands. Our center, has a national focus for Hispanic and Latino communities and the workforce that provides services to these populations. Our PTTC is staffed by Maxine Henry, our project director, Doka Michelle Zelaya, project coordinator, and myself serving as the program specialist. Our distinguished presenter today is Fabricia Prado, trilingual social worker trilingual clinical social worker in the state of Georgia. She obtained her master's degree in social work from the Kennesaw State University and a master's degree in psychology from the Pontifica Universidade Católica de Goiás in Brazil. Fabrícia has obtained certification as an ACE interface master training through the National Hispanic Latino PTTC and ATTC. 
She is working to increase community awareness of the prevalence of ACEs and its public health impact for the building resilience in the Hispanic and Latino organizations and communities. Fabricia obtained specialized training in mindfulness-based stress reduction, trauma-focused CBT and EMDR in order to best help the demand of working with trauma within Latinx community. And since the beginning of the pandemic, she has prioritized her attention on training courses and continuing education in the area of grief. Fabricia currently works in private clinic and she has also working with the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC and PTTC under their cultural and linguistic approach to expand their training resources and webinars, including Brazilian, Portuguese, and Spanish, Spanish communities. Thank you, Priscilla, for that wonderful introduction. I'm thankful to NALBA and the National Hispanic and Latino PTTC for this opportunity to present this webinar in Portuguese. It is very comfortable to be able to speak our language to talk about this difficult topic. This presentation will be like a conversation. This webinar will be one and a half hours, which is a short time to talk about a lot of these things. You will soon see the learning objectives and I am aware that they are too comprehensive for the time we have. Let's try to do the best we can and address this delicate topic. Talking about grief can elicit intense emotions like sadness, anger, or longing in all of us. Priscilla and I, and all of you who said yes to be here today, I'm considering that you are open and comfortable to feeling uncomfortable. I have to also say that I ask you to respect your personal boundaries. What that means is if you are feeling uncomfortable and only have a few resources to manage these intense emotions, that you moderate your participation. You can even be more radical and leave the presentation if you feel like. Staying is an invitation to feel a certain level of discomfort but also the possibility of relief and more hope. You may also be able to understand, name your feelings and understand a little bit more about the process of grief that maybe you are experiencing. We will say words like grief, death, dead, losses, etc. So I want to intentionally repeat these words here now as an attempt to start breaking a Breaking this context bit down a little bit, the literary, literalization. These words, and especially in our culture, they are associated with negative things. And there are some beliefs, some superstitions, some fears about what these mere words could evoke. I would also like to explain that this webinar was born from these conversations that Priscilla and I had, and we had many of them. We talked for at least four hours and I think in these exchanges, Priscilla was the one who identified the potential benefit of extending this conversation here to you all on this platform in the form of a webinar where we could exchange our experiences and what we learned from each other. We could feel supported or understood, validated in this experience of listening to each other. From these conversations, it is the idea of the webinar that came to life. So we will try to replicate them during this presentation. I also have to say that I am in a process of recent grief, having lost my father-in-law on June 21st, and Priscilla also lost an aunt, and she will talk more about it. So we are bringing our bereavement too. It has also been my experience that since the beginning of the pandemic, the state of Georgia, where I live, opened an emotional support line for COVID. So I signed up as a volunteer and started answering calls from people who wanted a call for some emotional support. And then I started seeing in a very clear way the issue of grief. Until then, I didn't think I had such a comprehensive understanding of what grief implied, especially in some calls that were related to frontline workers. People seeing friends, coworkers, part of their team who died due to COVID. So there were many calls, many listening experiences in this sense with callers, clients, and from my own experiences. So this webinar will gather all of this, these personal experiences, life experiences, theories, clinical experiences, and strategies to deal with grief. 
as it relates to my personal experience, at some point, I also had to realize that in fact, I had had multiple experiences of grief, including the grief of my husband who lost his brother many years ago. Then his dear brother, then his mother who had Alzheimer's and now his father. So it was the whole nuclear family. And before that, I had a great loss of my sister Fabiola who died in 2005. And I was in Brazil when it happened. And soon after I moved to the United States and it has had a lot to do with my grief. With such a great history of multiple experiences of grief, I lost my grandmother and other family members while I was living here in the US. My grandmother who lived in Goiânia and she passed away while I was here and I had the experience of going back to Brazil and she was no longer there. So there are all these issues that are difficult to deal with. So I'm very sensitive about grief for the matter of living something recent that also brings a little of other past grief. I want you to know that if you are also experiencing some kind of grief, that you are welcome to feel that you are not alone. Priscilla and I are going through this process and we open ourselves to it. Also, about two or three months ago, a great friend, Anna, a professor from Gaonia University, invited me to write an article about grief and acceptance and commitment therapies, and then invited our colleague, also Viviana, who is here in Atlanta. And we wrote together this article about grief and acceptance and commitment therapy. We started this about three months before the death of my father-in-law, and then Priscilla brought the invitation for this webinar. So there were several circumstances with COVID, including my mother who had severe COVID and was hospitalized for 30 days. Several people from my family, um, my cousins, aunts were hospitalized with COVID and it was very scary. I believe that all of us are having this experience today. We will be talking about it, also sharing these personal life experiences. And Priscilla has a very beautiful experience, very meaningful to share with us. In order to talk and be open about these conversations, here are some helplines if you feel very overwhelmed, even after participating in this webinar. There are helplines in Brazil, in the United States, and in Portugal. And here are the learning objectives. So first, we're gonna focus on grief. What is grief? The process of grief, details about that process. We wanna expand our knowledge, our understanding of what grief is and expand on that knowledge. Then we will reflect a little on normality. And I know that we are at different times here in the United States and in Brazil in this post vaccination period, but we will deal with cultural values and differences about this current moment. Three, we will also review information on substance use and mental health. Um, what happened to this within the context of the pandemic. And lastly, at the end, we will discuss some strategies from acceptance and commitment therapy in this process of experiencing grief. <clears throat> so to start with, I would like you to think, if you hear someone say, I'm grieving, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Um, for those of you who are on the live webinar, please answer this in the chat. So from the live webinar, we see people have replied mixed feelings after the loss. She is grieving at the moment. Yep, mixed feelings is very common. Also as part of grief, these waves of grief can look like these waves that come from joy, sadness, gratitude, guilt, suffering or loss. Someone else in the chat said, can I do something for that person? So we see here that there's a concern for others and a desire to do something for them as they're grieving. Um, Roseanne wrote, what can I do? How can I help? And that we're gonna talk about later. On the next slide, we will share some images and we will ask you to choose one that represents how you feel about grief right now. Please know that these images can be triggering for some folks. But the idea here is to have a baseline of how you are feeling about your grief now. And then at the end, we're gonna ask you the same question again. So taking a look at these images, if you were to choose an image that is at this moment, a representation of your grief, what would it be? During the live event, a poll question appeared and participants were able to answer. 
Most of the participants voted for image five, which is an image of this person alone, sitting on a bench, looking at the infinite, the horizon. I also identify a lot with this picture. What about you, Priscilla? I think today I identify mostly with number one. It's kind of peaceful. One year ago, I would probably be more like a number four as I was feeling a lot of anger and very upset. Maybe if you ask me again tomorrow, it will be a different image instead, because like you said, the process comes in waves and it's not linear. So I believe we will talk a little bit more about it at the end of this presentation. Thank you for that, Priscilla. So I would like to share this poetry from my dear friend, Tarsila, who is a professor of literature at UFG in Goyas. And she recently launched this book called Stamped Feelings, an essay on love in times of pandemic. Um, I want you to know I had the joy of receiving this in my mailbox. I don't know if you are in your 40s, maybe 50s, you can understand very well the incredible feeling of opening your mailbox and receiving something concrete, like a paper, a card, a book, something you can touch. So it was very nice to receive this book, especially because it arrived on the birthday of my beloved sister, Fabiola. When my mother and brother were at my house to celebrate Fabiola's birthday and my mother even read and she liked it a lot and it was very interesting. All information shared from this book will be in the references page, including Tarsila's contact if you want to acquire the book. In the pandemic, in poetry, in love, there is no other purpose but to destroy all the preconceived senses. I think that this is an excellent introduction to the message I want to share about grief, because that's what happens. That's what grief does. The pandemic evokes the losses that resonate in poetry and reflect in love and what it does to us. It turns our world upside down. It shakes everything that existed in a certain order, in our way of making sense of the world, of understanding each other, of interacting with each other. And everything we knew and believed is questioned. We go into a journey to reestablish meaning after our experience of grief and our process of grieving. It really destroys, destroys preconceived feelings, making us review everything we thought and believed before. So what is grief? I added some very classic definitions that are very interesting. Although this experience of suffering a loss is universal as we all suffer, with whom we suffer and for how long we suffer is contingent on culture, historical time, religious and spiritual beliefs, personality traits, and multiple factors that will determine how we grieve. In the words of Dr. Teresa A. Rando, who is a psychologist and director of the Institute for the Study and Treatment of Grief since the 70s, and a clinical researcher in the field of thanatology, which is the study of death and dying, says that grief refers to this process of experiencing the psychological, behavioral, social, and physical reactions of loss. So grief is not only in relation to death, but also to all kinds of losses. And we will talk more about that later. It is important to observe how grief can affect the living beings, other species as well, in their entirety, including with physical symptoms such as stomach pain, changes in appetite, shortness of breath, social isolation, confusion, concern about the future, shock, guilt, feelings of helplessness, dreams with the deceased person, constant crying or hyperactivity and various other symptoms. So there's no way in which you look and say, ah, this is grief and this is exactly what it looks like as it can be manifested in various ways. In the second definition here, we talk about loss contingent to the environment, historical, cultural context, and that also involves a response to anticipatory loss, which is the normal process of grief that occurs when, for example, your loved one is still alive and you are waiting for his death. Let me give you an example. Um, it's like when someone has been diagnosed with a terminal illness or has been dealing with a chronic disease for a long period of time there are anticipatory grief reactions that can be experienced by us, by those who are related to that person, by the person who is sick or terminally ill, expecting to die. Each person's reactions will influence how the family or the person who is dealing with the illness experiences grief. 
My family lived this process with the death of my brother-in-law who was hospitalized for two years. And it created this roller coaster of emotions in the family. One day being hopeful for improvement and at the same time, sometimes even on the same day, losing all hope or feeling tired or even feeling guilty for feeling tired. And especially the people who were there next to him, his children, his wife, who were taking care of him daily and then constantly living in this roller coaster of emotions. We all experienced a lot of grief with COVID since with every hospitalization, a process of preparation for a possible death begins in all of us. Several people in my family were hospitalized and we always felt scared. My mom, as I said, was hospitalized for 30 days. And luckily we were very blessed by, my, by having a doctor in the hospital who was Brazilian. And my mom was his first Brazilian patient. This doctor visited her every day. My brother had managed a way to stay in the room with her, and we strongly believe that she survived because he was there taking care of her as a nurse. And then this Brazilian doctor, Dr. Costa, would call me every night to report on her. And one day he said, she is at a stage that anything can happen. She can tomorrow start improving or she can enter a curve where it's going to get worse. And he said, I can't predict what is going to happen. So we went through a couple of days of high anxiety in the situation of anticipatory grief. And I believe that many of you also with relatives, family members with COVID, either hospitalized, hospitalized or not living the anticipatory grief, which evokes many unusual responses. Then we have the third definition from David Kessler, whom I like to listen to in trainings, podcasts, and his books about grief. He speaks in a very profound way and talks about how grief is a reflection of one of connection that has been lost. And he has this well-known phrase that, quote, each person's grief is, a un is as unique as their fingerprint, end quote. He also says how the grief and pain of grief is within us and no one can see. But he also draws attention to the fact that we want our pain to be witnessed, validated, we do not want to be grieving on an island. We do not need to think that bereaved is a being damaged. We do not need to be fixed. We need to receive from others and ourselves the right to be grieving. And grief should be a zone of non-judgment. Grieving will never end and should never be compared. Even if experienced by your twin brother, the loss of the same person, or by a father or mother. Others may grieve in different ways and it doesn't compare. There are several profiles of grievers. So there are those people who will grieve in a more public way, who express more openly how they feel. And then there are more private people who do not cry or who might never cry. And this cannot be understood as a sign that the person doesn't love or doesn't care enough or isn't suffering. In his book, Finding Meaning, David Kessler explains examples of legal cases in which the person was found guilty because he did not manifest grief did not manifest suffering. So the person was not an explicit griever. And then many years later, some evidence showed that this person was actually innocent. So this is a great you know, way to remember that we can have profiles of grievers who experience and express grief and mourning in different ways. We also have several types of grief, which I'd like to explain here. We have the natural grief, anticipatory grief, as we already talked about, we have unrecognized grief. We also have delayed grief when after six months of a situation happening, the person begins to enter the process of grief. Or they seem like they haven't felt anything. Then after a year or so, something happens that evokes these emotional responses of grief. There are gestational, neonatal grief, collective grief. That is what we are living now that led us to this state of shock anxiety, like in the wars or the Holocaust, huge tragedies such as what has happened in Brazil or due to human cause or these criminal cases that happened such as uh, Menino or Boy, Henry and Isabella, which led the whole country of Brazil to collectively experience grief. And now our experience with the pandemic, which we will talk about further. We also have traumatic grief, which can be a result of suffering the death of a loved one, um, complicated or difficult to overcome due to the traumatic stress caused by the tragic and shocking circumstances of the event of the death. 
And many may experience classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, such as flashbacks, nightmares, etc. Complicated grief is described in the Manual of Psychiatric Disorders as persistent, complex bereavement disorder. This description is not very well received by me and many other professionals in the field because we don't like the criteria of time, which is symptoms of grief that last more than 12 months for adults, then would be adjusted within other symptoms as complicated diagnosis and six months for children. And as we talked about before, in fact, grief specialists teach us that there is no predetermined time to experience grief. <clears throat> During the live event, we asked, what are some examples of losses that are not recognized or automatically understood as grief? Um, those that you have seen or have already experienced. What types of losses are not very recognized? Participants in the live event shared things such as losing jobs, breakups, abortion, divorce, losing your pets, retirement, social status, job losses again were mentioned perinatal loss one more time, and then also travel plans. So we're all actually sharing everything that we really need to pay more attention to because they are not very recognized as grief. In this way, we can become more attentive and more sensitive to these losses that need also to be witnessed and recognized by others. We have several others I will not list here because we have already listed enough, but there's also grief in the process of migration. The psychologist and professor specialist in grief, Nazare, explains so well and in a very good course I took with her. She offers interesting courses and she talks a lot about the grief of being an immigrant and the migration process. We will talk more about it later. I wanted Priscilla to share a little bit with us about her experience about grief and loss is not recognized, especially as an immigrant. Priscilla? Thank you. I would like to start by saying that this picture has been authorized. All the beautiful picture people here in this picture gave me permission for us to use the image on this training. Some of them were actually present during the live webinar. So during some of my conversations with Fabricia, I found that was very interesting that other losses can also be experienced as grief and not necessarily only those losses related to the death itself. So when we started these conversations a few months ago, Fabricia, you explained to me that, and it made a lot of sense for my own experiences as an immigrant. At uh, first I was like, I'm really missing my family, my friends, and I'm missing the moments uh, that I cannot experience with them because I'm living far away. But I don't think this pain can be compared to grief. I thought that was actually very silly, especially considering everything else that is happening in the world. But this picture came as a memory on my social media and normally I would be very happy and would bring me joy. Earlier this year actually made me feel the opposite. I was sad and upset. This is the memory of the last time I was back in Brazil, the last time that I spent time with my family and friends in my home country back in April of 2019. Uh, living abroad, I planned to see my family and friends at least once per year and I was able to do so on my first year living here in the US, but with the pandemic, the borders are closed, I cannot go. And it's just very sensitive to me sometimes. There are babies in this photo that has already grown and there are friends that they were pregnant or became pregnant and I could not see them. I could not even meet the babies yet. So sometimes when I think about these people and these moments, I do feel happiness and I am grateful for the things that we share together. But oftentimes I actually grieve for the moments I'm missing them and for how long have been since the last time I was able to be with them. Uh, one of the participants during the live event uh, listed grief of losing hope, which came from one of my friends, Mariana. So thinking about her comment, I think that I also try to take a more positive approach and see things with more optimism, more hopeful. Like I do not know when, I feel like I'm still counting the days without knowing how many days are left until I can see my family and friends again, but I'm very hopeful that it will happen anytime soon. Like we say at the beginning, grief is not a linear process. There are days that I am more 
peaceful, happier, hopeful. But there are days that a picture or a memory of like this picture can be triggering for me and can ruin my entire day. I, I don't feel like I can, I can be productive. I get very sensitive. Not that, that it, this is a problem. We, we have to give ourselves permission to feel. But what I'm trying to say is that in my experience, I'm trying to give myself permission to feel, to understand what I'm feeling, to talk about it, what I'm feeling, and do something about it. I think we will address a little bit more at the end of this presentation and provide you some tools that can be used to move on to the next stages, even knowing that we will more likely to be moving back to the fourth and then the third and then the first stages of our grief. But I just thought it was interesting to see missing my family and friends as also a grieving process. Thank you for sharing that, Priscilla, um, your life experiences and for sharing this beautiful family picture to help us understand, especially for those of you who are in Brazil now and has family in the United States or for anyone living you know, in a different place far away from your family and friends, um, that you understand that being here is not only so wonderful as you may think, but the psychologist that I mentioned earlier speaks a lot about this too. What is behind the photos posted on Instagram, on Facebook? The difficulties we face with weather, language, documentation, that maybe times we cannot come and go as Priscilla was saying. Having to postpone travel plans. Anxiety related to this concern about being able to go and come back. The loss of these family moments. These meetings when families take pictures of everyone together and they share it with us, but we're not there. So it can be very painful also for those who are here and the longing that is part of this experience. And when we say here, we mean those that are in the US who have migrated here, but who have family back in our home country. But Isila has already been in these moments when she can also feel gratitude and joy for the time she misses them, but sometimes also feels the sadness that is part of this experience. So thank you for being open to sharing this with us, Priscilla. Something very interesting to think about also is, have you ever thought that positive events can also trigger a grieving process, such as getting married or having children or adopting children? What about retiring, finishing college, a program that you were very involved in? These experiences are also transition and they can involve this mix of you gaining and achieving many things, but also losing others. Or you get in touch with certain losses that happens when you win certain things. This is normal. It is a part of life and these emotions and experiences are the two sides of the exact same coin, the joy and the sadness that come hand in hand. Some people shared during the live session about the grief of the idealized son, the idealized relationship, the expectations of a son or daughter who will be a certain way. Um, so my brother Fabio, works with people with intellectual disabilities and works a lot with the issue of expectations with parents, um, acceptance, expectation about their children developing certain skills, uh, certain dreams that parents can have. They made a 30 minute documentary sharing some of these family experiences and sharing about the advantage, the beauty and the types of rewards that you cannot see otherwise. But those things only come through suffering, but it also comes with some pain. So what are the six stages of grief? A lot of this here you can read from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on death and dying, which was launched in 1969 to reflect on these experiences, especially in hospitals, focusing on terminally ill patients and how it identifies substantial examples that illustrate these stages of grief. Also, David Kessler, uh, Finding Meaning, um, that book describes the sixth stage of grief. So in all the podcasts, articles, interviews, and books that I've read about these stages, they always explain that the stages of grief are not linear. And not all people go through these stages or go through them at all. Um, or they might pass through only one or none, and not necessarily in the order that we're going to describe them here. But many people find it very useful to approach these processes as part of normalizing and validating the grieving experience. So here in the first stage, we have denial, in which it is difficult to accept the reality of loss that can be experienced by, in this case, a patient, and also by the family of that patient. 
It can create great anxiety uh, when, the with, when the patient and the family receive the diagnosis or learn about a possible imminent death too abruptly or in a premature way. But for almost all people and the author, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, um, denial is not necessarily something negative all the time, but it can be a response that serves the person at some point to be able to collect themselves from the shock and then be able to respond in other ways um, to the grief experiences. So denial can be used as a buffer in this sense. And even in these stages of denial, people can um, move back and forth between this and a partial acceptance. Something very common in clinical care during the pandemic, and I'll also share this dilemma of how many people live in conflict about following the news and feeling a moral responsibility to do something about the shocking realities versus the need to turn off completely or at least temporarily to preserve our mental health. You've already been through this. So in Brazil, especially, I have noticed this use of this, the use of this strategy of denial as a necessary pause to redirect attention to other things in life that balance and restore the sense of hope for the world. I really like a speech by Tara Brock uh, about how we need to attend to joy, just as it is part of our wholeness to be attentive to the suffering of the world and feel this kind of tenderness so that we can respond and be part of our world. It is also part of our commitment to integrity, to be attentive in a way that allows us to feel our love for life. She refers to Mary Oliver's poem that says, my job is to love the world. So that is a reminder that life is a constant dose of our attention and dedication to both our pain and to those who suffer. And equally important, it is to pay attention to what is right in us, in others and in the world. So it is also part of our moral responsibility to not discount the good or whatever is right in the world, because this can also create a reality bias or distortion. So next we have anger. When one can no longer deny reality, it is common for someone to experience anger, questioning, why me or why my family? Anything but that, or who's to blame, right? We wanna find someone to blame for this. So we say, who am I gonna blame for this? That's when anger is present, it, but this is part of the process. I was recently reminded of my angry reaction during my sister's funeral, and I do not remember a word I spoke but I remember the sensations. I remember the presence of my friends and I remember uh, Tarsila. I remember the presence of my friends who were there and who supported me. I have a few friends I would say, but very good friends, very close. And this experience of anger can happen especially at the very moment of the loss or death. So it's good to have your friends close by, even virtually or over the phone. Next, we have negotiation or bargaining. These are part of the grieving process when we try to postpone or negotiate loss and death. And here the element of faith and spirituality shows up quite a lot. When we make promises, it's an attempt to avoid the worst. And that was a reaction of mine when I was in childbirth. Induced labor, there was this moment when the baby disappeared and so many nurses entering in the room. My first reaction was to negotiate with God and talk as if he survives, I'm going to do this and that. This moment of everything, anything but this, which is part of this attempt to avoid and postpone a potential loss. Then we move on to depression. Here, anger is replaced by the experience of a great loss, and this process can come with isolation, complications, and the less we allow ourselves space to be sad and devastated and miserable by our losses. Um, you know, we need to allow ourselves to do this without criticism, judgment, or other people rushing us to get out of this stage, to move on from this stage, because they can no longer stand to see us or to see us fill our pain. So sadness often turns to depression because it's very difficult to find people who can also be with us in this silence, to just listen, to be open to our pain without urging us into trying to problem solve or to get us out of there as soon as possible. Then we have acceptance. This is the recognition of the reality of the loss. It doesn't mean that the pain has ceased, 
um, to exist. It just means that we accept that we're going to live with this pain. The pain can still be very intense at this stage, but it is a moment of recognition to come to terms, to almost come to peace with what has happened. And the search for meaning is the transformation of grief into something more, into something greater that fills part of the void and gives us a new direction of life in the process of adjusting to living with the absence of what or who has been lost. This is commonly how great works in the world are born from pain. Most nonprofit organizations, for inst instance, um, have been the result of the search for meaning in a process of grieving experienced by someone. Maybe you may not find meaning in your life after the loss. Um, David Kessler, the author we mentioned earlier, argues that everything you do has the potential to make sense. How you can honor your loved one. How can you create a life that includes them? And how can you use your experience to help others? All these are part of the portion of finding meaning in the process of grief. So as we dig a little bit deeper, um, the therapy of acceptance and commitment is focused on the search for meaning through committed action, through identifying values and committing to actions that are aligned with those values. Here we go into some more detail about how we understand the process of grief and some factors that influence this grieving process. So who are you going into the loss shapes how you will experience this loss. Then factors that will influence who was the person who died, the nature and depth of the bond, maybe unresolved problems that we had with the person who passed away, things you did not speak and you would like to have spoken to them, maybe having said, I love you more, um, or to have asked for forgiveness for something. Also, the type of death, the proximity of the death. Did it happen suddenly? Was it expected? How long from sickness until death? The level of anticipation of death um, might also influence, right? Was there violence, trauma? Was it preventable? If you were present or not at the time of the death, and it can be less stressful to be present and know exactly how it happened versus being left wondering about what happened and, of course, what we think about what we could have done to avoid it. Many people get stuck in this process of what they could have done to avoid a loss and focusing on things that actually could not be controlled by us or the person who we did lose. We also have previous factors related to the person who passed away that will influence our grief process, such as attachment theory which will bring the issue of our childhood, how our bonding has been established with our parents, how we develop our attachment style, for example. Insecure attachment is one of the biggest predictors of complicated grief, age and gender, et cetera. And our grieving process is also important to talk about and let children and adolescents be included in this process. When teenagers and children are included, they are validated. They feel that they receive the status of a family member. They are taken seriously. They are important and they have the experience of being able to deal with death and loss in their own way, according to how they understand death and loss, their own beliefs and values. Religion offers the relief of infinity of death not being the end. And depending on the belief as to where, how, and with whom, and if we will be able to meet our loved ones again, this can help the process by bringing comfort or expectations. Other beliefs leave this world temporarily, or if they are in a purgatory, or if they are together with God waiting. Um, maybe they've evolved. Um, maybe they're reincarnating several times, then all these beliefs, um, they influence how we grieve. What is your family belief? What about your culture, your community? This will all influence how you interpret and give meaning to losses and death and how you will recognize themselves to continue living in the absence of the loved one or the loss of something in your life. The long life expectancy of the absence of disease when people say it was too early, the person was too young. When a person was older, we assumed that they were happy and lived a long life, right? Which is not always the case. 
the matter of time we talked about quality above the number of years lived. All this is part of making sense of death. Some deaths that are stigmatized depending on how that death happened, such as death by suicide. And, you know, I want to remind people that they have the right to talk about, um, we should be talking about, I'm sorry, uh, death by suicide or died by suicide. And we should never say that someone committed suicide. This is important because language matters. So death by COVID, death by overdose, by opioids, um, or for instance, death by suicide are all stigmatized deaths. A little bit more difficult to talk about, right? So now let's talk about COVID. I don't know if you've experienced this, but there were people feeling even ashamed that they had COVID, feeling judged or like we were not so blessed as the other families who didn't get COVID. As in theology of prosperity in which not having any illness, prosperity, victory and success is a sign of God's approval and the opposite is a sign of sin. You must be doing something wrong. This is a little dangerous because it can create a life that has to always be in line with prosperity, victory, only the good, and allows no place for suffering. It is very unrealistic, and we take away the opportunity of exploring pain and suffering as part of religious or spiritual experiences with God. C.S. Lewis speaks well about the issue of suffering and God. I highly recommend that you all take a look at that. So here's another poem from the book I spoke about earlier, Stamped Feelings. Mythicken lovers and someone with COVID-19 are always closer than we wanted. So in this part, we are introducing the topic of the pandemic with this mix of pain and relief, a way to process within the frightening reality that there are risks in loving and in being alive. And no one is really protected from either mistaken lovers or COVID-19. Okay, so now a question for you. How are you feeling about the pandemic? During the live session, we give a few seconds to answer this question. Um, so ask yourself, are you feeling tired, angry, pessimistic, hopeful? You feeling that there's some courage? What about optimistic? Today, I'm hopeful and heartfelt. Now tomorrow, that's another story. We have a good measure of people feeling tiredness, fatigued, discouraged, half with anxiety or all of the above. In the live session, 27% of participants responded that they were feeling um, hope and encouragement. And 7% were op optimistic that the best is yet to come. So we can see how overwhelmed we are already. We're tired angry and very afraid and anxious about what we are experiencing. We are at different times, in different places, in different boats, sailing through all of this at this, you know, together. Thank you all for having answered. And when a collective trauma like this occurs, it will affect each individual and community differently. We have to look at what was there before the collective trauma happened. What was the size of our resilience zone? how our nervous system was, and if we had experienced previous traumas, or if we had had other problems or other traumas occurring or co-occurring with this trauma of the pandemic within the larger non-individual but social context, political context, economic and social cultural context, where the pandemic happened. All this will influence how we will experience and respond individually and collectively to the pandemic. Here, I want to visually list to you a portion of what we are collectively experiencing. Feelings that we can actually identify. It all starts with COVID-19. Then we had social distancing, reduced affection, isolation, hygiene rituals changed, new health concerns, loss of freedom to come and go, loss of commemorative and social events, increased stress, inequalities, loss of employment, lack of infrastructure, lack of information, public dismay, conflicts due to political differences, 
illness and death of friends and family members, loss of funeral rituals, stigma of having had COVID, post-COVID conditions such as guilt, loneliness, anger, and impotence, shock, divorces, struggle, and grief, depression and anxiety, the intensification of existing mental health issues and substance use disorders. The list goes on and on. So what else? This is just for us to stop for a second and take a look at this. We are surviving all this. And this is only a part of the losses, but we also discovered and developed new skills. And what, we dis what did we discover that is positive? Did we discover mutual support? People going outside their zone to help in other communities. What about outside of what is familiar to them and reaching out to support each other? So it's not always the negative pieces that we know are numerous and various, but also the positive things that have come out of our current grieving. So here in five verses, Tarsila summarizes all this saying, balance of social isolation by preventing COVID-19, 151st day of quarantine, insomnia, migraine, self-medication, anxiety, smoking compulsion, heart attack, itching, numbness in the left arm, alopecia, shortness of breath, fear of dying, alcoholism, divorce, all within the statistics. So the previous slide was very dense in meaning. Facts, and as I was developing the graph on the previous slide, I felt the rhythm Tarsila writes here, right? There's no commas, there's no pause, there's no rest, one thing after another. And I put an end point and said, enough. Then I was creating a graph and saw that there was no end. So the graph that you all saw on the previous slide will never be able to explain what we're going through all at the same time. So let's move on to briefly talk about mental health and substance use in the context of COVID-19. In the graph on the left, you can see the comparison of adult reports on symptoms of anxiety and depression. In the blue column is 2019. And the orange column is January of 2021. During the pandemic, our concerns about mental health and substance use increased, including concerns about suicidal ideation. On the right side, you have a comparison by race and ethnicity. And you will see here Hispanics, Latinos, and African Americans or Black communities have been disproportionately affected at all levels by the pandemic. I will ask you to please go to the references and come back and look more, um, take some more time with these graphs. Um, think about what, you know, this context means and, and, you know, what you can do to kind of increase your understanding of how different communities are experiencing the same pandemic in different ways. This graph here shows visits to emergency rooms related to substance use, such as alcohol. 45% of ER visits during the pandemic are related to alcohol use. Here we see a study that came out in July of 2021 showing that over 80,000 patients under 20 years old took a, uh, were taken as a sample. And it was stated that 11,613 had confirmed to be infected with COVID. This shows a very set of sad data that regarding, I apologize, this shows very sad data regarding Brazil and some other Latin American countries like Peru. COVID, had a, COVID has affected Brazilian children and the risk that has increased, especially with babies and children under two years old. Those of indigenous ethnicity from the Northeastern regions to the North, one, two, three or more pre-existing conditions. And in a study group formed between Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Costa Rica, and Brazil, they also found this comparison and the highest numbers of deaths among children in relation to the European cohorts. So here's a polling question. What did the pandemic unmask? Take a moment, think about it. The real answer is all of the above. Right, the pandemic unmasked and highlighted inequity, inequality, stigma, mental health problems, anxiety due to uncertainty to the future, increased alcohol use. All of this has become more apparent.
So we're calling this the post-vaccine period, but we know that we're still, you know, in a vaccine period. Uh, when we say post-vaccine period, we mean post the introduction of the vaccine. Um, but Isila and I talked a lot about, you know, the current period that we're living in now and about how there was a lot of confusion, um, lack of information, not sure if we had trusted information, different recommendations, uh, vaccinated versus unvaccinated communities or community members. Priscilla mentioned the issue of these uh, divergences or differences between family members, uh, between long distance relatives, or even those who are living together, of those who do not want to get vaccinated versus those who do want to get vaccinated, of those who do not believe in the vaccine, and that we are trying to make this collective pact to achieve herd immunity when the number of immune people reaches a level that slows the spread. For now, the safest thing to say is that the time to loosen the rules is when the actual number of cases and deaths are decreased in a substantial and sustainable way. So now let's talk a little bit about grief in the Hispanic community and some peculiar things like grief in the experience of being an immigrant. As we talked already with Priscilla's experience, this kind of imposter syndrome um, and guilt. Priscilla, I don't know if you want to comment here about what we talked about on the issue of the vaccine, on the issue of certain privileges that we understand we have and the guilt we may experience because of that. I think one of the reasons why today I feel more optimistic and with more hope regarding the pandemic is because I see today the many friends and family from, um, excuse me. So because I see that today, many of my friends and my family members, they are actually taking the first dose of the vaccine in Brazil. The process back there delayed a little bit, but seeing the progress of the vaccination campaign gives me more hope. I'm fully vaccinated since April and I didn't even share it with some people because at that time, my parents were not even able to get their first shot. I didn't share the information because I didn't want to be disrespectful. And this is just one of the examples of disparities you just mentioned. In your previous slide, you highlighted that pandemic unmasked and opened our eyes to these inequalities. Although my experience of living in the US is not perfect, it's really not perfect. Let me tell you, you don't believe in everything you see behind the Instagram pictures and nice trips. There is a lot going on. But I did feel blessed with the opportunity to get my vaccines as soon as I needed and wanted. I wish my family and friends had the same opportunity that I had getting their vaccine earlier. But I am happy that today I'm looking at everything with a little bit more happiness, optimism, thinking that after feeling a little bit stuck with the process in Brazil, I'm feeling that we are moving forward. Yep, I'm with you in this feeling of seeing that things are progressing, that there is hope. And then some factors to work with the Hispanic Latino communities, the importance of involving children, of incorporating the family, religion, culture, personal beliefs, and the level of acculturation of children. Priscilla also commented about the movie, as we know, Coco here in the US. Priscilla? Yes, and if you excuse me, there was a question during the live event about how to talk to children about the process of grief. And we put together several resources, many in Portuguese. You will receive the links and you will be able to access. That is a page only dedicated to resources around approaching this topic with children, how to talk to them about death, about grief. And this movie is now one of my favorite movies ever. One of my best friends had recommended to me for a while ago and I had never watched it before until recently. And I actually watched with her and I just cried during the entire movie. I grew up in a Christian home. So I think that there was a lot of superstitions and beliefs such as do not talk about the death or skulls are not from God and things like that. So I think I grew up with that mentality. So that was one of the reasons that even as a grown up, I still had some silly prejudice about some of it. So as I'm constantly learning and evolving, getting more connected with my culture, when I watched this movie, I thought that it's such a cool way to talk to kids and to show kids about the process of death and the need to talk about the people who passed away because there is so much about not doing it. 
I've learned that do not talk about someone who is dead because otherwise we will attract bad things or we will not let this person rest in peace. So I think that I grew up hearing so many popular sayings and many beliefs that I don't think they are right or wrong. That's not my place to say, but I think that we have to choose what makes the most sense for us. Today, this move served as a comfort to my soul. So I think that not talking about the people I lost do not lessen the pain of their absence. It's more about finding ways to keep them in my life, to keep their memory alive and including them by talking to them, writing to them, remembering them. I think all of this has been very therapeutic and comforting to me at least. So for those who ask it in the Q&A, I truly recommend this movie. Parents and adults, please watch it first. See what you think. And if you think it is a good idea, then watch again with your child. I believe it's an easy and beautiful way to approach the topic. Uh, yeah, there are several ways to honor the dear people um, who we've lost, right, by death. Uh, but Sila, I'm going to let you continue now because I know you have some really beautiful experiences to share. Thank you. So like we mentioned in the beginning, I am also in the process of grieving my auntie, my second mom, actually. She passed away uh, in May last year, and it was very complicated because it was suddenly and she was healthy. Um, under her circumstances, she was health and we we're not expecting at all. And when it happened, not even my family back in Brazil, they were able to be together because it was already in the context of the pandemic. So the combination of death, sudden death, death without the funeral and goodbyes, all of this was very sad and traumatic. And I think to, that, to this day, uh, I know that the grief process doesn't have an end. But I think we're still trying to understand and how to access the feelings and how to process in a better way. To me, if you tell me, like if you would have told me like 10 years ago, oh, go talk to animals, listen what the animals are trying to tell you, I would just say, what? Like this doesn't make any sense. Like I'm not Snow White, how can I be talking to animals? But recently, like especially in May when it was the one year anniversary of my Tia's death, this bird kept coming in my way very often. Like this bird kept coming every day when I was going my, uh, to my walk um, here on the trail next to my house. So I live in a place that has a lot of green spaces and I see several types of animals and birds, but this one had never appeared before I, or I had never paid attention to this bird before. So as it started coming very often, I searched on Google and I was like, what does it mean? Like, what is this kind of bird? And then I found out, at least that's what Google said, that it meant that a dear someone passed away, but is still close to you and want to talk to you, want to be present somehow. I don't know if this is true. I don't know. But for me and in my process, it brought a lot of comfort to know that my auntie may be around in some way and may be trying to talk to me by being present somehow. So I added this poem that you can access later when you have these slides. Again, this is just an example of finding what can work for you. Each process is going to be different. That is no rule, that is no right or wrong, but I think in my case is about being more open-minded to hear advice, to hear recommendations and to be with an open heart with less judgment and with a more open mind to find new ways to manage the pain of the loss. Thank you so much for sharing this wonderful experience, Priscilla. And I also like to believe the same as you, that it is not just by chance that what you felt um, is what you felt, that you actually noticed it because you were open to recognizing it. So when you received this experience of um, this presence, um, you were also open to receiving the comfort that it brought you. My mom also tells us at the time that my sister passed away, she wasn't present, right? She wasn't there physically. And she tells how she had a very vivid dream in which she met my sister and she was holding her right at the time of my sister's death. Um, so these experiences are very rich in our grief process. They don't need to be minimized, questioned, or judged, as Priscilla said. If we are open to processing our grief, uh, we should allow ourselves to feel our feelings as they show up. 
And this is a big step in, you know, working through a grieving process. So you may come to find comfort in and remember. Cardinals appear when angels are near. So go now, sit outside and drink your tea. Keep a lookout for the little red bird. It is there. Your loved one will be. So this is such a beautiful piece um, by Victoria McGovern. Thank you, Priscilla. All right, so unfortunately we're running out of time, but I do wanna share with you this information because it's the most important parts of grief in acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, let me say that again. Um, the most important parts of, of grief in acceptance and commitment therapy and I don't want to frustrate my colleagues or my dear friends or psychologists who are waiting for this part of ACT, as we call it, in grief treatment. So when I read other approaches or authors like David Kessler, who wrote on the sixth stage of grief, finding meaning, I can also do a reading of an ACT, pers ACT perspective. And there are other several works that we can take a look at. What we do with this interpretation and basically what um, acceptance and commitment therapy will bring us is that pain is inherent to the human condition and suffering would be the result of a process of psychological inflexibility. Grief is the result of interactions between the individual and the environment. One does not overcome or resolve grief, but learns to live with the grief in spite of having it. The finding of meaning in ACT are committed actions. So what are the attempts to deal with the pain and grief that may not help and can make it even more problematic, right? We were talking about how you grief can manifest and how we can approach it by being more open-minded. Uh, but now let's talk about the other side of this coin. So it can be problematic when we are attempting to avoid, remove, or ward off undesirable feelings, since they are supposedly the cause of the problem. But the truth is, the more you avoid, the more you numb, the more you don't get in touch with or don't identify the situations, feelings, beliefs, thoughts, and bodily sensations that are evoked by the contingencies of grief, such as, let's say, sadness, or anger, guilt, sometimes even relief. It makes it difficult to change the behaviors that are problematic to you and engage in behaviors that are desired. So it's what Priscilla has said, you know, it's to be open and willing to feel. Yeah, the pain is going to be very difficult. Many people do not want to or are afraid to imagine um, what it's going to be like if they feel the pain. They think it's going to be catastrophic or we think we're going to be consumed by it. But actually, this avoidance creates or is actually part of the problem. Another problem is fusion with thoughts and feelings, reacting as if you yourself are the feelings or the thoughts, as if you're going to wear the grief, right? Like it's glued on to you. So clients will, also say, will often say, it's my grief, my grief, my depression, my anxiety. They don't let me do this or that. So when I hear this, um, I confront some people and ask, you know, remind them that they can realize that actually sometimes they didn't even want to separate themselves from these psychological feelings and reactions. They explain that this is part of their identity, that they were too afraid not to know what to do if this pain or depression or anxiety wasn't a part of them. So in ACT, we teach through the use of metaphors. This process of separating um, or diffusing and becoming observers of our own thoughts and feelings. So let's say that it's like if you were in the sky and they were the clouds passing through. But these feelings aren't you. You're the sky and your thoughts and feelings are the clouds. So you see how we kind of separate them, even though we know that they're um, involved with each other. We also have the metaphor of the chessboard. You are the board and the feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations are the pieces on the board. But when you're an observer and you see them passing by, you see how dynamic they are. You see that often they don't need to be so reactive to them. You can simply just let them be. We don't have to always react to the clouds. We can just let them be. 
And then there's a strategy from dialectical behavioral therapy called urge surfing, which teaches us to notice urges that are peaking, growing, and then breaking down and going away. You don't necessarily have to react to it and get so stuck in this circular motion of not doing what is important to you and what would make you feel better because you're not feeling well. It's hoping to be able to do what is important to you. So you don't feel well and you don't know what's important to you. Um, what would make you feel well? So see, if you understand that this circle, this loop, this way that you can have the problem of engaging in self-destructive behaviors that can go opposite to what actually you should be doing to help heal and to help actually feel and move through the grieving process. So while we're not gonna cover this slide, you know, I do wanna say that while you can download the presentation and access this information later on your own time, um, when you're taking a look at this slide, I want you to think about, you know, some of the ways that you can participate in moving through your own grief. Um, you know, not just thinking that these pieces are stuck to you with this psychological inflexibility, but instead to have psychological flexibility, right? Um, understand your values and, and get some clarification on, on those values. And then maybe moving on to committed actions and saying, okay, now that I've identified my values, what can I do as a person to honor those values um, that will help me in this healing process as I'm grieving? Um, so I encourage you to take a deeper look at this and to see how you can apply it to your own um, life and your own grieving experiences. So this is the part that I'd most like to leave for you as an ACT contribution. It's actually an adaptation of the ACT matrix made by an ACT therapist, Jacob Martinez. He calls it grief tricks. Try saying that five times fast. Um, I've enjoyed using it with clients and I leave it to you to take a, a deeper look later. Um, but maybe you can use this grief tricks exercise. So it starts on the right, on the right side. And it's what brings you closer to your values, right? What is really important to you um, from the left half that moves you away from your values? Um, what can you do to actually move closer to the right toward your values? In this matrix adapted to grief, you start in the lower quadrant on the right side. And you think of the qualities of your loved one. And you start putting there the qualities you would like to incorporate into your own life from now on. And you circle those qualities from your list. In the second quadrant on the lower left side, what happens when you try to do this? Are there feelings like fear and anxiety that show up? And then you want to move on to the upper left quadrant. Um, number three, what are you doing to avoid these feelings, these thoughts, these memories? And then that's where the loop happens, right? Because you keep running there trying to avoid the feeling because it feels more comfortable to not grieve, to not be in pain, to not miss someone. So where you really want to be is that number four. It's blue on the right upper side. What actions can you take that would lead you toward incorporating these qualities into your life? This way, you allow your loss or the loved one you lost to live through you, through your committed actions uh, that are inspired by them. So I would like to leave you with this reflection, this contribution of the acceptance and commitment therapy. I would also like to offer that earlier we talked about other types of grief that aren't necessarily, a lo necessarily the loss of a loved one. Somebody you know, mentioned earlier more than once the loss of a job that we don't necessarily consider um, when we're talking about grief. So, you know, we don't want to think about that loss. We don't want to think about what this means to our families financially, um, what it means to our self-esteem, for instance. Um, and so what can we take from the job? We're not going to automatically lose those skills. Uh, what can we take to maybe look for our next job? Um, what about some of the mistakes we made? What can we use from that in order to incorporate them into a more positive, committed action moving forward? So you can apply this to all types of grief and you can really just create different puzzle pieces to move toward this um, ACT grief tricks exercise.
So again, we're not going to be able to deeply cover the content of this slide, but since you'll be able to access the entire deck later, um, I do want you to take some time, I encourage you at least to take some time to learn about the 13 ACT strategies for attending to grief. I'll mention a couple real quickly. Um, we've been talking about connecting with your values. So how can we use our values to also incorporate self-compassion? How can, you know, we be as understanding with ourselves and our process of grief as we are with other people when they come to us? When we asked earlier in the um, live webinar, what people think when they hear other people saying they're grieving, most people have mentioned, what can I do for you? But we don't give ourselves those same allowances when we're grieving, right? We expect ourselves to move on quickly, to not be in pain, to, to not be vulnerable. Um, we talked about the movie Coco and you, you know, number 10 here, using morning rituals. If it's useful to you, you don't have to use a morning ritual. Um, but if there is one that you find that's useful to help you attend to these feelings, what would that look like? And how can you implement those? Um, not just for the loss of a loved one, but for other um, losses that we might be grieving. So take some time, sit with this list. Um, you don't have to pressure yourself into, you know, doing all 13 things all at once. But how can we move through this list and start to include this in our own attention to our grief? And what of these pieces can we offer to other people that they might be able to implement uh, while they're grieving? Even if you're not a professional, how can you offer some of this that's non-judgmental, that gives them the space to explore it as they see fit? Um, so there are several ways that you can respond to your bereaved friends and relatives. Um, you can use the list that we just talked about in the previous slide. Um, so I know sometimes we want to support them, but we don't know how to offer assistance. So here are some ways that you can be there for your bereaved friends and relatives. For instance, you could just validate their feelings. You don't have to develop or a deadline or establish it for them, right? You don't have to compare. You know, we can just listen and not say, oh, yep, I grieved the same way. Or when I grieved the loss of my father, I felt this way. You can just sit and listen. You can share happy memories if, if that would help them, you know, to remember that there was still some joy that, that this loss, um, you know, before the loss that we had with this situation or with this person. We can help them find a meaning in the present. We can just offer compassion. Um, we can just feel our love for life and help them identify their love for life by helping them just explore that and giving them almost permission to explore that. And next, um, here are some alternative ways that we can express our own feelings, um, both to ourselves, right, when we have this internal dialogue, but also with others when we're talking about our grief. Um, instead of telling someone, you know, let it go. That's enough. Just stop suffering. You've, you know, this, you lost that job 18 months ago, you know, just shake it off already. Instead, we can say, you know, it's okay to not be okay. So what has happened in the last 18 months? What have you done in the last 18 months? Um, you know, you, we can tell ourselves, I'm noticing at this very moment that even though this loss occurred a long time ago, I'm starting to feel the emptiness today and the loneliness at this very moment. So these are just some examples of how we can turn kind of this negative self-talk and external talk into some more positive, um, open ways that allow us to explore instead of um, just trying to do what we can to quickly end the grief. Okay, so we've circled back around. Um, this is one of the first slides and as we talked about, we wanted to um, have you ask yourself again, um, how are you feeling? If you could use a picture in this slide here to represent your grief. So maybe with the information that we provided with you today, you can see your grief represented in a different picture than you selected at the top of the webinar. 
So the, again, the idea is for you to have had a baseline on how you were feeling about your grief an hour and a half ago and how you're feeling about it now. Um, and since you'll have access to the slide, maybe this is something that you can help when you're speaking with children, right? Um, maybe you find different pictures that represent what grief might look like um, when you're ready to speak with your children or with your teenagers. Um, maybe you can help use these pictures to explain how you're feeling to other people, because sometimes it feels heavy to use the words, and so you can use pictures. Um, but we really, you know, want you to just find other opportunities to be able to articulate grief as a way to um, work through grief in that process. So we have one more polling question. It's a challenging one here. So suppose you can choose between these two options. Which one would you choose? You can answer in the chat or you can just you know, think about it on your own. Would you start to love and care about all kinds of people and things? Then when you lose what or who is important to you, you feel intense pain? Or would you rather never have any of those painful feelings again, but that means you can never love or care about anyone or anything ever again? Just, you know, think about what that would feel like either way if you, if you were able to choose one of those two options. All right. So lastly, I wanna share with you this beautiful poem by C.S. Lewis about love, loss, and God in suffering. For those of us who, you know, lean on our spirituality, um, these can be some ways for us to articulate and to connect with others um, when we're suffering ways that we can um, kind of reach outwardly and see that we're not alone in this. Um, and then here's another beautiful poem by Khalil Gibran. It's about joy and sorrow. And lastly, a poem by Robbie, um, a litany of remembrance. We remember them. Next few slides, you're going to see all of the references that we promised you. Um, you'll be able to use as many of these references as you see fit. Well, thank you so much. We will start our Q&A portion. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I know we will not have enough time to answer them all, but I'm checking and I'm gonna make a commitment with Fabricia. So we will go over all the questions that we will not be able to answer during the live session and we will provide you a follow-up with the answers. We can start with Raquel, my mother. She has the first question. Uh, does it take for a child the same time that it takes for an adult to complete all the stages of grief? Thanks for that question. We can't say that any one person will take the same time as we have seen. Each person will live or experience grief differently and there's no predetermined time. I don't like to use the criteria of time, although even the Manual of Psychiatric Disorders uses for adults 12 months to experience all the symptoms of grief. And if it's over 12 months, it would be complicated grief. And for children, um, the time limit is six months. In other words, as if the children were to process the grief more quickly, right? One thing my brother always says is that he admires how children are very rooted in the present. Children have this advantage of not being so contaminated with the verbal community, with everything that we are contaminated by in terms of how we deal with our own thoughts. And generally speaking, children seem to have an easier time engaging in the present and redirecting themselves in the present. Whereas adults can get stuck in some phases, guilt, and we have a lot more complex issues to deal with. And the child has this advantage of being present, of being in the present but there is no way to determine that. It is possible that in a family, the child will have a grief process longer than an adult. It depends, for example, if the adult is very spiritual, reads a lot, takes courses, is in therapy, does a lot of things that this child maybe 
has some difficulties doing, such as processing information, some difficulties in terms of understanding grief, especially for not being at the same level of understanding scientific knowledge, theoretical or spiritual knowledge as the adult. So it can be the case, but we cannot generalize either. Thank you. We have another question from Marismar. Is the fear of losing people that we deeply love considered an anticipated grief? This is my dear aunt, Marismar. All my aunts are very kind, very dear to me, and she is a nurse. So she possibly has a lot to say about grief experiences that she's witnessed, um, or even her own experiences. I would say that it would be perhaps anxiety, you know? If the person we are afraid of losing has been in the process of becoming ill, I would say yes. It would be part of the anticipatory grief when entering the disease process. For example, someone received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or of cancer, a diagnosis like that of being almost terminally ill and there's no cure or it is at a certain advanced stage, right? So yes, this would be part of the anticipatory grief. Now, if there is no diagnosed illness, there is no sign of imminent death, this could be part of anxiety disorders. It could be anxiety uh, regarding losing. And when I would say that spirituality can help, acceptance and commitment theory can help by creating and bringing the acceptance that living in this world is a constant from the moment we are born, this risk that if we attach, if we love, if we desire anything, any object or anyone, we are at risk of losing it. And we can live in the acceptance or we can live in the anxiety trying to control everything so it doesn't happen, even what we cannot control. Thank you. So the next question came from Rafael, and he is a professional in the healthcare field. He's mentioning that he recently read a book by Dr. Ana Quintana, a specialist in terminal illness patients care from Brazil where she said that not talking about death does not mean that we are going to prevent or even postpone its arrival, but instead it makes the process more difficult for those who stay. I thought a lot about it and I understand that even for us who are work, working in the health field, the issue of death is not widely addressed and we never needed to be prepared to talk about that as much as right now with, in this moment of the pandemic. Do you think death, which is a natural process of life, is it still a taboo even for healthcare professionals? Yeah, you know, thank you very much for this excellent comment and question. I agree with everything said in the comment. And yes, part of it all can be contributed or attributed to how to even say the word death. Um, it comes you know, it feels very loaded when we say that, and it's often associated with meanings that are sometimes even superstitious or religious or spiritual. Um, you know, there might be a fear that was instilled in our culture regarding death. You know, there might be this figure, this personification of death as someone who will come, will take and will steal. This fear of certain things that we cannot talk about because speaking about them could bring them upon us some type of bad um, future or negative consequence. Um, this is a behavior analysis, for example, can be understood as superstitious behavior. And so it's difficult also, while it's taboo, it is very much part of Brazilian culture. Um, and when we really look at it, it's not only Brazilian culture, in North American culture too. But I see that there are a lot of um, there's a lot here that if you have a much greater openness to talking about death, for example, just in terms of facts, we have countless grief, grief groups in any church. There's a church here around the corner in Georgia, and I bet there's a grief group there offered maybe twice a week for the community. So that alone is an example of how Brazil is just starting in the process. I believe that in the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary teams at the hospitals, when there is participation of social workers, psychologists, um, hospitals who bring and contribute to this kind of approach to death and dying and allowing people to talk about it, you know? Um, so perhaps we join a grief group. Let's talk about our grief, about the loss or the death. Um, let's talk about it in a preparatory and sensitive way. 
you know, when I think back to my father-in-law who comes from a British background, he's always talked about death. He always talked about it and left everything prepared. All his wishes were established, the memorial, everything was already paid, prepared, scheduled. He thought of every detail, especially for his wife who passed away before him with Alzheimer's. And he supervised everything and took care of every detail down to the smallest one. So there was 100% pre preparation so that he could live his best life until he reached the end. So it's about organizational planning. Here in the United States, when we go to the doctor, they have been asking, and Priscilla and I were also talking about this recently, do you have a will? What are your last wishes? Um, would you like this or would you like that to be done? Um, and there's even a form with papers that you can leave answered in case something does happen to you. This way, all your wishes are already established there at the hospital. So for example, in my family, my son participated in this morning that we experienced. Um, he went with us. He said that he wanted to. He would make a point of going to the memorial, um, of being there at the moment of death, at the time of the funeral rituals that we talked about earlier. We talk about our desires. We talk about what we don't want, what we want, and we feel that this is a way easier option um, for us to process and accept because we're dealing with the reality of life. Um, and yeah, part of it might be taboo. And part of it, I see it as this process that will gradually be more developed. This interdisciplinary experience of allocating resources and opportunities. So Ana Carolina Aquino, my friend who is present here at the live event, who is also a professor, has a grief group based on acceptance and commitment therapy being offered for free. Uh, she supervises interns at the college clinic, which opened a few months ago and will possibly open again, I think, um, maybe in a few months. And if it is there, we can also share this as a resource for anyone in Brazil um, to participate in this grieving group. So it's very important that we have space to talk about death and dying in a natural way, in a dignified way, in a way that validates our life. I don't think it causes our experience to be sad or heavier this way. I think this brings gratitude. This makes life um, easier to be focused on what really matters because you know that your time here is finite. Amazing, thank you. So I have now two comments here that I wanted to read, both from the same person, Ana Laura. She is saying, I am one of the organizers of the book that includes the beautiful chapter that you, Ana Carolina and Bibiana wrote together. What an honor to be here and to meet you. You're so beautiful, so sensitive, so thank you. And she also adds that she found very interesting the possibility of seeing the grieving process with the seasonal idea that this process tends to soften with the passing of the seasons. Like the person's first birthday after the loss tends to be sadder than the second one. The first Christmas tends to be harder than the second Christmas and so on. So I don't know if you wanna comment anything about it. Yes, thank you very much. And I want you to know it's an honor for me that you are present. And I hope everyone can have access to this amazing book that will come out soon. So read more details about it. So the excellent professionals who are contributing there to the book, writing about these experiences about grief within behavioral therapy. So I found your comment to be very beautiful and very hopeful to think this way. You know, there's the pain, the grief, but we don't need to connect it with, we don't need to connect with it, with this pain and grief, just in these negative ways. We can connect with the grief through love too. And yes, uh, there are firsts. It makes sense that at first it might hurt more. Like for me, the way I felt 15 days ago, uh, we even postponed the live webinar, right, Priscilla, which was supposed to be done earlier, but I was going through this grieving process. I was actually in Brazil. Uh, we postponed it to the 27th because if I had done it before, I would be crying here. And not that there's a problem with that, especially in ACT, as we talked about during the presentation, I would still be here crying and talking, but we're present, we're doing what matters to us. But the title of the webinar would have to be adjusted to talking and crying, right? Um, but as time passed, I see that I'm changing. 
those emotional reactions are changing. And yes, I found it beautiful how you expressed it to be based on the seasons. And then these changes that we go through, in a way we get less connected with the pain with time and more connected with love, gratitude and other positive things. I said something to Priscilla in our last conversation and she found it very interesting. I told her when I was talking about my grandmother, um, who is a bigger love figure in this world, right? Um, every Sunday we had lunch at her house. When I was a teenager, maybe 17, 18 years old, on many Sundays, I didn't want to go. And, you know, I had other things to do. Then we grew up, became adults, and our values and the hierarchy of values changed. The value I give these moments I share with her grew a lot more. And consequently, even after my grandmother died, she grew even more inside of me. My relationship with her, and that's what we can think of. Our relationship with the people we've lost or the things we've lost doesn't necessarily need to be stopped. It can continue in an even deeper way, which is my experience with my grandmother. Through my aunts who totally opened space for dialogue about my sister, about my grandmother. Uh, my aunts replicate my grandmother's recipes. They replicate so many of my grandmother's things. They carry so many of um, the things that she used to share with us. And they share those things from my grandmother's past. Um, you know, then I become curious. I want to know. I want to learn more. How was she? Where did she grow up? What was her house like? To know where this immense love she had came from. So it seems I grew in the knowledge of her, in the love and in the desire to connect with her, and especially after her passing. This is so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. I have goosebumps and there was a comment at the live event saying that how beautiful is what you just shared about your grandmother and how wonderful it is to be reminded of that. I thought about a conversation we had that also we, you talked about your sister, which uh, the movie Coco reminded me about it as well. So the movie talks about celebrating life rather than putting our attention on the sorrow celebrating the time that the person spent with us and finding ways to keep them alive in our memory. Uh, you also shared about your sister. I don't even know if I could be saying that, but I will take, I already take your advice and I already pass it on that to try to celebrate the life of the person who passed away on their birthday, like cooking a recipe that the person really liked or doing something, some kind of activity that the person enjoyed, trying to make the memory keeping the memory alive and beautiful and present in us and maybe on on the anniversary of the dead try to do something that will honor the person not so much as a festive way but maybe talk taking the time to address the longing itself allow yourself to cry share stories to give permission permission to talk about death even if it brings suffering tears but maybe this is a moment for us to remember the person too well, I've already passed this advice on and I've, I'm very happy that you're using your experience, not only as a professional with all the background the courses that you have taken, but also being vulnerable and bringing these experiences of your father-in-law, your grandmother, your sister to enrich the conversation and inspire others. I'm sure we could keep talking about it for a long time and will still not be enough time to cover everything that we would like to share with you all, but this is the end of our webinar. So please, here's our contact information. Reach out to us if you want to learn more about our resources, trainings, and upcoming events. We are completely available to assist you. Uh, here's the contact information for our presenter, Fabricia Prado. You can email her directly. You can also access her website if you have any questions that we were not able to cover during the live event. During the live event, we also shared our evaluation. This is very important for the work that we do. Uh, thank you for your time. And I really appreciate everyone's participation here. You will receive this material and an email with a certificate with the slides, with the link with the survey again. And I really thank our presenter for all the partnership throughout the years with our centers and for her willingness to put herself in a way so beautiful, so vulnerable, so honest to use her own experience to not only help myself selfishly, but also to help with the participants of this webinar. Hope you have a great day. Thank you. Gracias. Obrigada.